So you could turn. Here we go. Okay. Hey, Good. give me a little pat on the back here. Nice job. <laughs> all right. We need it all. <laughs> I'm going to have you take over IT for my household. Yeah, I don't do that. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. It is Tuesday, January 26th, 10.02 a.m., and this is a meeting of Senate Natural Resources and Energy. Uh, today, we're picking up on the weatherization story that we started uh, a little more than a week ago, and uh, we're going to hear from Mr. Coda and Mr. Fazy. Um, so... Uh, let me not spend too much more time on an intro and just go to Mr. Coda, who uh, kindly emailed the committee after we heard our Act 62 report on Friday and said he had additional information that he'd like to share with us so that um, we're getting more complete information. So with that, good morning, Mr. Coda. Good to see you again. Uh, good to see you all again, and thank you for inviting me in to provide some comments uh, based on the Act 62 study and uh, some of the things that we heard about on Friday and, and anything that the committee wishes to know. Uh, just for background, uh, many of you do know me, but um, I run the uh, Vermont Fuel Dealers Association. I've been the executive director there. Um, and one of the things that we do is we train truck drivers and heat techs. That's what we do when I'm not testifying or advocating for the energy industry. I also administer a rebate program for fuel tanks and I run a heating assistance charity called the Split the Ticket Fund. I've worked inside the state house um, well, if you count this year, the virtual state house for 17 years now, two as a journalist and 15 as an advocate for um, energy providers in the heating service industry. Um, so with that background, um, I want to point out two things, well, four things, but two things that I think the report got right and two things that it didn't quite get right um, with the X62 report, which was comprehensive and um, absolutely comprehensive. The first point, about the Act 62 report is something that we've heard often, and many of you have as well, which is a talking point by those that support the Transportation Climate Initiative, or TCI it's referred to, which is uh, repeated by um, uh, Commissioner uh, Cheney, which was that we might as well join the TCI because we're gonna end up paying the tax anyways, and we might as well get the money. Um, let me state clearly and concisely as best I can that this talking point is incorrect. Um, it would be true and only true if all the gasoline and diesel fuel that is purchased and used in Vermont came from a TCI compliant jurisdiction. So right now, the only four jurisdictions that are part of the TCI are Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and the District of Columbia. Um, New York and New Hampshire um, have decided not to join the TCI for different reasons. New York is going for a low carbon fuel standard and New Hampshire is not doesn't want to go that direction at all. Um, but even if New York and New Hampshire and Massachusetts were all part of the Transportation Climate Initiative, it's still not true that we would be paying anyways. That's because the fuel, the majority of fuel used in Vermont, just like the majority of electrons that flow into Vermont, come from north to south. They come from the province of Quebec. The province of Quebec, specifically the Levis refinery, uh, the Shangolan refinery in Levis, uh, or Levis um, comes into Vermont by truck or transport, uh, train, truck transport or train car. Um, and that's where we get our fuel. And under no scenario devised by the Georgetown Climate Center would this fuel be assessed a TCI tax um, unless we participated in the compact. And if we did participate in the compact, how that tax would be collected is... Uh, uh, is it an intricate weave of how that would happen. So I just want to assert that the talking point that we're going to pay anyways, simply not correct. Um, the second point in the Act 62 Coda, report. You, sorry, sure. mate, quick question on that. Can you break out a little bit a uh, percentage of fuel coming from different jurisdictions? Like uh, uh, I wasn't sure. really aware of how much comes from Canada. So, so the fuel, we don't have a refinery. We don't have any oil wells. We don't have any pipelines in Vermont, except for a pipeline, the Portland pipeline, which doesn't even have a stop. It just skirts through the Northeast Kingdom on its way to Portland, Maine. But the fuel that we use, uh, the liquid fuel, propane, heating oil, diesel fuel, kerosene, gasoline, um, it all comes from by truck or by train. Um, it comes from four places. It comes from Quebec, 
It's either comes from uh, the refinery directly or is by pipelines to Montreal where it's brought in by truck or the refinery by train. That's where a majority of our fuel comes from. The second place that it comes from uh, is the Port of Albany, Albany, New York, uh, where it comes in via pipeline and via train. And then it's brought to either by truck to smaller terminals or by rail car to smaller terminals within Vermont. Um, it also comes from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, the fuel there, there comes from the, the St. John refinery, which is brought in by barge into Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, if you've ever been through Portsmouth, you've seen the large tankers there. That's where fuel comes into largely to Windsor County. A small amount of fuel does come from Springfield, Vermont, um, particularly those who live in Brattleboro or Bells Falls. Um, uh, that's where any Massachusetts fuel is coming from. The, uh, there's a series of terminals in Springfield, Vermont, but that is about 10%. But if something's right 10% of the time, doesn't mean it's right all the time. The majority okay. of our fuel would come from non-TCI states or jurisdictions, okay. I should say. The so, other point- 50% uh, or better is sourced out of Canada. Yes. It, particularly okay. now because the border's closed to all but essential workforce. So the men and women that drive the trucks that bring the fuel that keeps us warm and keeps our cars moving, they're essential. The fuel is essential. And because day trippers or visitors and tourists, while it's hurting our tourism industry, it is clearing up the border. If you've been to the border recently, all you're seeing is fuel trucks and, 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 uh, and, and logging trucks. Um, so it is easier than ever to bring fuel from Canada. So that percentage is ticking up because of COVID. Um, okay. So. The, the second reference that um, I think needs to be clarified, there are 59 references in the Act 62 study uh, to something called fuel switching. Um, and this might seem minor to those that casually reading it, but, but it means a lot for those people that um, are in the industry, uh, particularly the heating service industry. When it refers to fuel switching, it's talking about the installation of an electric cold climate heat pump not new technology, the men and women I work for, the heating service industry, we've installed thousands and thousands of these Mitsubishi and LG devices in homes across Vermont. In fact, according to a recent uh, tier three filing, which is the 2015 Energy Act tier three filing showing that electric utilities are incentivizing these devices. Um, I think GMP reported that uh, over 10,000 of them were installed in 2020 alone. Um, I, was, I received some information from ISO New England, uh, courtesy of TJ Poor, that shows that by the end of the decade, there'll be more than 80,000 homes in Vermont with an electric cold climate heat pump. Um, that's about a third of our building stock, which is impressive when you look at the other states, such as Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Massachusetts, by the end of the decade, is only expected to have 20% of their homes with cold climate heat pumps. In New Hampshire, less than 10% of their homes are expected to have it. So. Um, we're far ahead of our neighbors when it comes to installing electric heaters. Um, but the problem with the Act 62 report, while there is a robust market, uh, and we're part of it, of installing these cold climate heat pumps, there's very little switching going on. So it's a misnomer, but it's an important misnomer to, to point out because when you take out an oil heat burner, you install a gas burner, convert it to natural gas or propane, you are absolutely switching. Um, when you trade in your gasoline powered vehicle and buy a Nissan Leaf, an all electric vehicle, you are absolutely switching. But when you install a cold climate heat pump, it's more akin to installing a, a Renai gas space heater or a pellet stove. You're heating a space, not a home. Um, and we know that because we're the ones that both install it and the ones that provide the fuel for the home as well. But you shouldn't take my word for it. Um, you should take the word of the public service department, uh, which has done studies and has, has all the tier three filings and the word of TJ Poor with the uh, Department of Public Service, which indicates that the installation of a cold climate heat pump uh, will take about 40% of the heat load. And that's right. Now, do we live in a world where you could put solar panels on the roof, R30 insulation in the walls, three mini splits in the windows, um, and maybe a pellet stove and avoid any fossil fuel combustion? Absolutely. Can happen, is happening, but it's not happening most of the time. What happens 10% of the time is not what happens all the time. In reality, uh, we're seeing 40% of the heat load. Now that's not insignificant. That's nothing to sneeze at. I mean, if you think about 
we have 80,000 homes by the end of the decade that use electric cold climate heat pumps, okay? That's what we're on target to make with the given incentive structure that we've set out since the 2015 Energy Act. Um, 20, 80,000 homes, um, that's about 56 million gallons of heating oil, given the average home uses about 700 gallons. So you put, take 40% of that load off, you put it towards electricity. We're talking about these homes needing 22 million fewer gallons, but they'll still need to purchase that other 60%, whether it comes from wood, or it comes from heating oil or propane or natural gas, or if it comes from renewable liquid fuels. Um, so, so our concern is that as people talk about fuel switching, they assume when my furnace dies, I will install a Mitsubishi mini split, done, done. And that's not the case. Um, it's not the case in the majority of cases. So uh, sure. when we talk about fuel switching, uh, language matters. Um, okay. And so we prefer we not use that term okay. when referring to- well, It's helpful, meetings. very helpful to hear the, the numbers, how it's, do you have, do you have a term you, prefer like supplementary heating or complementary yeah. or what what do you think is a more accurate way to, to refer to it so yeah. that fuel switching doesn't just live on as the term that people yeah. refer to yeah it's supplement it's supplemental heating um it's it's no different than installing a pellet stove if you say i don't want to pay so much for propane natural gas or heating oil i want to install a wood stove because I've got wood, I'd like to you know stack and put it in, dry it and put it in, and and, and save on my heat load. You're not you're not getting rid of your oil tank. You're not tossing out your oil burner or your gas burner. You are simply using it less, and that's what is happening in real time. Um, uh, and it's happening quickly. Our gallons are going down, um, but they're not going away, uh, and that's so important to keep in mind. Couple things that, that the X62 study did get right that I just like to highlight that, that I feel like I, I need to underscore it or, or perhaps it'll be forgotten about, which is on page 14 of the report where it talks about the thermal efficiency benefit charge. Well, I'm um, sorry, can I recognize. One second. Sure. So, Go ahead. Uh, thanks. Uh, Senator Campion, so, please. So, I, I appreciate this, this sort of back and forth. Are we, is Mr. Coda? Uh, just correcting this report right now is, are we gonna hear back? Is there a back and forth? Um, you're writing things down, Senator Bray, changing language. Can you just help me out here in terms of, of, of where things are gonna land? Sure, thanks for the clarification. No, I, because Mr. Cody got in touch with me uh, shortly after the testimony, I said, you know, we always, we wanna hear from everyone. So oh, the, right. the, the PUC will be back in to talk with us. So I wasn't, I just wanted in a timely way as we thought about this stuff in the coming week um, to have another perspective on those numbers. And um, happily enough, those two things talked about so far are, uh, anyway, so for instance, TCI, good to know, but we're, that's not what we're gonna be bearing down on in the coming week. Uh, anyway, so, but right. very, okay. thank you for that. Yep. Yeah. Our, you know, with regards to fuel switching, our concern, quite frankly, Senator Campion, is not the language in a report that is going to be read by 50 smart people that are involved in energy policy. The concern is that the language gets spread down to the person that is debating about whether or not to fix a furnace or install a tank and think that, oh, all I need to do is install a cold climate heat pump and my heating worries are gone. And we know that not to be true and we don't want that to be repeated right. uh, to you. get bad advice to consumers to put them in a, essentially a harmful situation where their pipes freeze. Right. Um, but but some of the two things, and I'll be brief about what, what the report- uh, uh, I Sorry, think Mr. Coda, uh, I see Senator McCormick's hand up. Um, yeah, thanks. The, I, I want to clarify the difference here between the uh, fuel switching and supplemental heating. What about if a person, for example, heats primarily with wood and uses their propane or their oil as the backup? So that the primary, then, then it would would, would the, wouldn't the propane or the oil be the supplemental heat? You're, you're absolutely right, uh, Senator McCormick. And, and part of that, 
you know, we our data, the data comes from many different places, but with regards to how we heat our homes, um, that's primarily done by the US Census and the American Community Survey. And there are, according to the most recent data com that comes from 2018, when it comes to wood, 41,660 Vermonters identify, about 16% of the houses in Vermont identify wood as their primary source of heat. We know full well, although we don't have hard numbers, we just, we know anecdotally that those 41,660 homes in Vermont, the 16% that use wood and identify it as their primary source of heat, that they also have a backup. Maybe they have propane for cooking, maybe they have it for power generation, um, maybe they have oil for uh, a backup in case they don't get the, the enough wood in or whatever. So we know that to be true. And, and those, and we assume that that survey data is as close to real as possible. Um, but you're right, there are certain situations where people are using more electricity than they are using propane, natural gas, or heating oil as their supplemental side. And there are certainly cases where they're using more wood uh, than the other fossil fuel. But the point that I was trying to make that in, only in very extreme examples, um, are they only using electricity or are they only using wood? So switching is when you're, when you're completely using one source, which switching from one source to the other, not balancing the different fuels depending on cost uh, and depending on availability. I, for about 25, 30 years, I, I, had, I had nothing in the house but a wood stove. But when my sons moved out, <laughs> I got <laughs> propane as a backup. And, it, and always, it immediately became my primary heat, I got to admit. Okay, thanks. So I'd like to I'd like to remark if it's okay, uh, uh, Chairman Bray, on, on two things that I would like to point out that I think are important to note about the XCC2 report. One is on page 14, um, and in page 14, it recognizes as we talk about the thermal efficiency benefit charge, a, a, a charge or a tax or a fee, however you want to term it, that doesn't exist yet, but is considered in the X62 report and may be considered by this committee, uh, which is that it recognizes renewable liquid fuel. It's important to us. There are not all, but there are many uh, heating oil dealers that are part, part of the energy transformation towards a renewable fuel. And they see a future in selling renewable liquid fuels, primarily biodiesel blended heating oil. And so what that report does, that Act 62 report, is it recognizes the progress that this would make as we've seen in New York, as we've seen in Massachusetts and in California, where renewable distillate fuel as a transportation and heating fuel is in fact reducing carbon emissions. And it recognizes that, the PUC recognizes that in the Act 62 report by, by eliminating or discounting, depending on the blend level, the thermal efficiency benefit charge for those fuel sellers that sell a renewable liquid fuel. That's important. And if, if this charge goes forward, it's something that we think is vital to preserving to ensure that the companies, the local companies that deliver renewable liquid fuels, um, that they're incentivized to continue to do that. And they're incentivized to continue to reduce the carbon emissions in the, in the thermal sector. So we'd like to highlight that part. The second part that I'd like to highlight is with regards to, um, who gets or what fuels are charged. So the existing fuel tax, there are, there are three taxes that, that happen on heating fuels. There's the petroleum cleanup fee, which is one cent per gallon. There's the sales tax, if it's sold to a business. And then there's the fuel tax, which is the two cent per gallon fee that goes towards weatherization. This is currently assessed on heating oil, propane, kerosene, and dye diesel. So dye diesel, diesel fuel is being charged the two cent tax to pay for low income weatherization. Uh, the thermal efficiency benefit charge, it does not have the, um, uh, the tax on dye diesel. And that's correct, that's correct. Why we have the fuel tax on dye diesel, uh, I had a front row seat, so I'm happy to, to dive into it. But essentially dye diesel, for people that uh, are, are unaware of what dye diesel is, diesel fuel, dye diesel is diesel fuel that is not assessed the federal or state excise tax, which adds up to about 55 cents a gallon. Um, it's dyed red, so the IRS and the Department of Motor Vehicles can identify tax cheats. Who uses dye diesel? People that don't have to pay the federal and state excise tax at 55 cents a gallon. This includes school districts who buy dye diesel for their school buses. 
This includes municipalities, which use dye diesel for their plow trucks, for their uh, graders and, and other equipment. It's used by the agricultural industry, it's used by farmers for their tractors, and it's used in the forestry industry for feller bunchers and skidders and all sorts of equipment that you use in the woods to harvest uh, timber and, and, and wood for other reasons. It's also used in generators, electric generators, peaking plants, and in trains. None of that uh, goes into the highway fund but it is assessed the uh, weatherization tax fee of two cents a gallon. Um, and the reason why it was is because we pay the tax, both taxes on heating oil and distillate on one form. That's FGR 15 form that we file with the tax department on the 25th of the month. And when we file that, it was for simplicity's sake, they just decided to keep the dye diesel tax, which is not an insignificant amount of gallons, 23 million gallons we sold in 2018. Um, gets the two cents as well. The thermal efficiency benefit charge recognizes that's not quite right because there's no thermal use happening there. Um, so they have since, uh, so, so the access to report doesn't assess it. If this were to go forward, I think one tax, since that you could have one tax that could benefit the low income weatherization program and other programs associated with the thermal um, weatherization um, rather than two. Um, but the design of the, the, but the benefits charge without taxing dye diesel for weatherization makes sense. Uh, one of the things we did advocate for, for full disclosure, is for dye diesel to be assessed the one cent fee, pollution fee. Uh, Senator McDonald has served on the Petroleum Cleanup Advisory Committee uh, with me and others. And we felt, and I still believe, that if a farmer benefits from the fund to clean up a spill, that they should be paying into the fund. Same with the harvester, same with the school district. Um, so that is appropriate, that one cent fee. I think okay. reasonable people could say it may not be appropriate for the two cent fee to be assessed against a farmer in a, in a school district. Okay. So those are the two well, things that I would comment on regarding that. Thanks for highlighting that. It, it certainly, um, when we get into the tax related issues on fuels, we'll, we'll slow down and dig deeper and uh, look at this stuff more carefully, but thanks for red flagging it for us. Oh, I shouldn't use that expression. Thanks for highlighting it for us. Um, Thank you. I have just a quick question and just looking for a brief preliminary answer. Do you know if, um, I think everyone in the committee is probably familiar with the, uh, um, if you do a full life cycle analysis on something like ethanol, you're spending more energy to make the ethanol than you're getting out of the product. So it doesn't seem like a wise way to create a new fuel. But for some of the, you're referring to uh, renewable liquid fuels, has anyone looked at, you know, from getting seeds, planting seeds, harvesting, processing, creating the fuel, trucking the fuel, sort of embedding the full, all the negative externalities or the full cost, whatever into that fuel. And can you say something about where we land in terms of costs and benefits on sure. that? Yes, Eth ethanol often confused with, biofuels are one, the big category, ethanol over here, alcohol from corn, and, uh, distillate over here, biodiesel from different types of crops, but also from fats and tallows and, and, and others. The energy ratio for distillate product, biofuel distillate is far greater than ethanol. Ethanol is a one to 1.1. 1 .1. Um, it satisfies the corn farmers and the Iowa voters, but it really is not a, <laughs> yeah, a yeah. good biofuel. Um, distillate is different. So the distillate, the, 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 the biodiesel that you're getting, uh, if you choose a provider that sells biodiesel, uh, most of it comes from, in Vermont, comes from the uh, Haverville, New Hampshire, where they're taking used cooking grease. Um, a tiny bit comes from uh, Jim Malloy in Plainfield. Um, but most of it comes from Haverville, New Hampshire, or Newport Biodiesel in Rhode Island. And they're taking used cooking grease, um, and they are distilling it into something that is akin to number two distillate, which can be used in diesel engines uh, or in oil burners. Um, much of it that is satisfying the, um, the low carbon fuel standard in California, and it's being used as a mandate in New York City for both their fleet vehicles and for uh, New York City municipal buildings um, is soy. It's soy coming from Nebraska, 
uh, and Missouri and, and other parts of the Midwest. And in that, the energy ratio is good because they're growing the soybeans to create the fiber for the animals. Um, they're going to create that soybean crop in what used to be a, a minor profit center of the crop, which is the oils that they have to squeeze out of in order to sell the fiber, um, has become a, uh, a tremendous economic boom for the soybean farmers because they have a secondary market for their crop. Um, so they're going to grow the soybeans anyways. Now they have a more valuable commodity off their farm, which is two crops off of one bean um, or two commodities off of one bean. Uh, so, we're, so, there, so if we are to satisfy, if the Northeast goes, goes to a mandate or some other type of, uh, we convert our industry to a renewable liquid fuel business, there's no doubt that we can't rely on cooking grease alone, uh, recycled veggie oils that will use some uh, soy crops, and also through different processes like um, the ethylovuvidate process in which you're taking an acidification of a pulp um, uh, and, you're, and you are creating a distillate product that can stand up to all the cold flow properties, which are important, but um, has a, uh, has wears on, on seals and gaskets. All this stuff, figuring out how to make a renewable liquid fuel is being done by several companies that are gonna make a profit, but it's also the research is being done in Plainview, New York by the National Research Alliance. And they're taking different uh, products and as well as underwriters laboratory, making sure that whatever renewable liquid fuels come up, that it works in existing systems. And if it doesn't, what needs to be replaced or repaired. Um, and you'll see companies like the Beckett Corporation, which is an American company, which is designing their new burners to go on new boilers and furnaces um, to withstand or to operate with a renewable liquid fuels. And that's SunTech is the same way. That's another burner manufacturer, um, Carlin as well. Um, they're all moving in this direction um, because we know that if we don't sell a renewable liquid fuel, we're not going to be selling liquid fuels for the long term. Okay. Um, just one quick question. Is there a national standard that fuels can meet or need to meet in order to gain that uh, certification of being a genuine renewable liquid fuel? Yep. And there's model legislation that... Uh, has been passed or is in the process of being passed in New York that has been passed in Massachusetts. It's an ASTM certification, American Society of Testing Materials, um, which signs off on it. So you can't just sell, you know, use cooking grease uh, or, you know, or whatever. You can't just sell any concoction made in, a, in your garage and pass it off as a renewable fuel. But there is a, a standard, a national standard that has to be met. Um, and complied with in order to receive that certification. And the reason to receive that certification is the federal government incentivizes uh, the blending of, of renewable fuels into the supply. They require it. So the renewable fuel uh, standard, the second one passed under President Obama, um, which requires the major oil companies to reduce their carbon footprint by putting more biofuels into their downstream supply. Um, all right, I'm looking to see if there are any questions from the committee. Thanks for walking us through your uh, material. We always learn something on your visits. Uh, at, um, so thanks for coming in on the, you know, the, the possible back and forth a little bit that uh, Senator Campion was referring to with PUC. We'll invite them back in and have you in the room at the same time so we can sort of nail down any loose ends, but um, it's helpful to fill out our picture. Uh, we're always expanding what we know about the, the energy side of things. And not seeing any questions for Mr. Coda, uh, I'd like to then move to Mr. Fazy And um, my request to, uh, to him was that, on Friday, the PUC referred to uh, an ecosystem of providers out there in the world of um, energy work as part of their analysis that we didn't really need to stand up entirely new programs. We needed to better support the programs we already have. Probably as they grow, there's some opportunities for coordination. But um, so I asked uh, Richard if he would help us better understand 
who the actors are in that ecosystem and how they operate um, so that as we work on weatherization, we'll know, you know who they are and we can think about enhancing what we do. So with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Fazy. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yes. So I've, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Uh, let's see. Uh, so tell me if you there. can see that. Yes, sir. OK. So um, uh, I've. Um, so as Senator Bray indicated, I was asked to provide a picture of Vermont's energy efficiency ecosystem. Um, as one might expect, um, there are many parts and pieces. So I'm, I'm gonna apologize in advance that um, there's a lot of information here. Uh, this, this presentation is posted on, um, on your uh, uh, committee site is my, my understanding. Um, so, um, uh, and I'm happy to answer questions as I go through this. So uh, let me let me let me start, and um, uh, and this this should I'm expecting this will take probably about half an hour. Um, so just in terms of time frame, I'm happy to to answer questions along the way. It may drag it out a little, uh, you know, might, might make it a, a little longer than that. But there's a lot of information to to cover the ground here. So one of the things I, I wanted to sort of sorry, um, yep. sorry to interrupt, uh, just so that everyone knows. So we have uh, and we have 90 minutes left. We're going to work till a little before noon and uh, we'll take one brief break in the middle. But this is the only thing we've scheduled for the balance of the morning. So I really wanted us to have enough time because I knew you had an information dense presentation. So I don't want people feeling sort of overwhelmed that we're flying past it all, we'll, we'll march along, but we certainly should, uh, committee members should ask questions and stuff so that we really can take in what's here, even if we're gonna need to look at it some more after today as well. And, and, and either way, Senator, if, if it's helpful to ask questions as I go, uh, when they're fresh in your mind, I'm happy to uh, try to address them at that point in time, or or we can go back and revisit the slides afterwards. E either either process works for me. So your your preference. Okay. Um, I guess you know we'll keep an eye on time, but let's ask questions as we go because uh, sometimes more technical questions are a little harder to hold on to. Great. Okay. Uh, so with that, uh, so with that, I just want to state that, um, so th I'm really focused on, as the, as the subtitle says here, Overview of Vermont's Energy Efficiency Buildings and Thermal Program. So I'm not talking about transportation and not talking about um, the uh, renewable, uh, the electricity programs. I'm really focused on, on buildings with sort of a, an emphasis on, on weatherization and, and the products that, that go in our buildings. But um, so just, just in terms of a, a scope that, 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 I'm, that I'm focusing on here. Um, for those of you who I don't know, I've been in this committee, um, seems like annually on one topic or another, uh, but I, I am uh, one of the principals at Energy Futures Group. We're based in Heinsburg. We've been around for about 10 years. Prior to that, I was at the VEIC um, and managed the consulting division there for, for um, I was there for 21 years and managed it, uh, was managing at the end of my, my tenure there before three of us left to start EFG. Um, I'm, I'm currently also on the board, I'm, the, I'm probably the token non-contractor on the Building Performance Professionals Association, which is the trade association of home performance contractors. Um, I'm the secretary there. I was the chair of the Energy Co-op of Vermont for a number of years and recently passed, passed the mantle on to um, Kelly Lucci from, from Efficiency Vermont. But um, we, as, as most of you probably know, Energy Co-op of Vermont is a, is a fuel dealer um, working to become an energy services provider, sort of diversifying and, and, and leading the way in, in, that, in that area. And I've been, I've been involved in a lot of Vermont um, issues over the years with Energy Action Network. Um, we've, we've done the energy code update process and working on building energy labeling, finance report, 
uh, the Thermal Efficiency Task Force uh, about eight years ago. I was a chair of the Finance and Funding Committee, et, et cetera. So I, I, have, um, I, ha I have my fingers in a lot of things that are going on. So I guess that's why Senator Gray asked me to, to, to talk about it. Um, EFG, um, we're a small 11-person um, clean energy consulting firm, been around for 10 years, based in Heinsburg. I'm, I'm there today in our net zero office building, which is, which is, is operating our heat pumps off the sun today and putting the extra into our Tesla batteries. So try to, try to walk the walk. Um, we work all over the country on, on, on these issues. So um, in terms of, uh, this is sort of an outline of what I'll be um, talking about in terms of agenda. And you can see there's a lot here. They're, they're probably, once, once, start, once start digging in, they're, they're really about 15 programs uh, in, in this area. Um, and so I'll, I'll be uh, following the organization that actually was in the, the initial, the preliminary Act 62 report, um, focusing initially on energy efficiency programs, uh, and then there are thermal efficiency programs, the uh, tier three electrification program, uh, cross-cutting programs, and then I'll have some recommendations at the end. Um, but so there's, I'll, I'll be following this order as well too. So under the uh, electrical efficiency programs, talking about the electric uh, efficiency, uh, energy efficiency utilities, the EEUs as we call them, BEB, Burlington Electric Department and Efficiency Vermont. There are then um, uh, three customer programs um, as well, two, and there's the state energy management program. Um, under the thermal efficiency programs, Vermont Gas, Efficiency Vermont and BED also operate thermal efficiency programs. There's the Weatherization Assistance Program or WAP and the Clean Energy Development Fund, uh, tier three under the electrific electrification program. And then there are, are three cross-cutting programs as well too. So there, there, there is a lot. Um, so uh, just in terms of, of overview, uh, I, I pulled most of this information, thank goodness, because I wouldn't have been able to, to pull all of these out uh, without having some references. But the Act 62 um, report, both the, uh, most of this, uh, a lot of this information came from the preliminary report that came out uh, a year ago. Um, and, but then as well too, as you know, you heard last week, the um, final report uh, from, from this year. And the third, third piece I pulled um, information from was um, a uh, Department of Public Service report of 2019 annual report on Vermont's progress toward building energy fitness goals. So annually, they, they, um, they pulled that report together um, and I'll reference that in a couple of the, the tables that I have in here. Um, so just to remind us all where all this act, where the, a lot of this activity comes from, uh, so you, as the legislature, have long required that uh, regulated utilities include comprehensive energy efficiency programs at least cost. Um, and that's sort of the, 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 the driving uh, directive behind these, uh, many of these initiatives. Um, so these are really designed, uh, they're, they're intended to design and deliver technical, financial, and education services for all sectors of, of the economy, residential, business, institutions, municipalities, and mechanisms used include financing support, technical assistance, uh, really ac across all these sectors. Um, and the, the overseeing this uh, is the PUC, Public Utilities Commission. Um, they, their role in this is establishing and adjusting the energy efficiency charges in order to pay for much of this. Um, and again, to, to um, try to realize all available cost-effective energy efficiency savings with due consideration to rate impacts and several policy priorities. So they're really the gatekeeper in this. Uh, there's also the uh, this geo-targeting is sort of our shorthand for, um, for making sure that, that um, these programs uh, that they, the PUC oversees provide uh, opportunities for all Vermonters to participate um, and targets those, those uh, programs uh, in, in certain locations, markets, customers, where they provide the greatest value. Um, so, so that, that is a directive as well too. It's not just run these programs, but make sure they're being provided in, to the right people in the right places, in the right sectors. Um, and and the, the basis for the, the charge that, that we all pay for on the, on the electric side uh, is, is based on three year budgets that, that, are, that um, uh, come out of uh, the demand resource plans or DRPs, which you've probably, uh, you're probably familiar with um, in the past as well too. 
And then uh, in addition to the PUC, the Department of Public Service plays an important role in this ecosystem as, as well too. Uh, they, they, as a third party, this is unusual. Many other, many other states don't um, have the firewall separated like this. So Vermont was smart in, in setting things up this way, but they, they're responsible for program evaluation, measurement and verification, make sure that the savings that, that the uh, utilities um, claim is, are actually materializing. Um, so the, they, they're paid for out of these three-year uh, budgets that the, that the utilities put forward. So that's part of, part of the fee as well, too, is to provide those services. They, they, they also review and negotiate utility plans and goals. Um, they, they provide some oversight and analysis, like, like the study that I referenced earlier. Um, they also support and develop the adoption of building energy codes. That's their responsibility, given that it, it cuts those cut across all um, utility territories in the state, um, and then and then periodically they they would probably um, say m more than what they'd like to do, but they're they they're asked every year to do studies and working groups as as you the legislature direct them. Uh, in addition to other things, I probably left off here, but they they play an important role in all this. So that's that's sort of the statewide big big picture. I'm going to jump now into the electric efficiency programs, unless there are any, any questions. I'll assume people will raise their hand or speak up. If, um. So we've got two um, electric efficiency utilities in the state, uh, or EEU. Uh, Burlington Electric Department, BED, and Efficiency Vermont, which is operated by the uh, 501c3 nonprofit corporation, Vermont Energy Investment Corporation. Um, they serve the rema remainder of the state in terms of electricity outside of, of uh, Burlington. So the EU's uh, similar language to what I, I talked about, the, the PUC's oversight. So this, this uh, sort of trickles down, um, delivering technical, financial, and educational services to help Vermonters overcome the barriers to improving energy efficiency of their homes, businesses, institutions, and municipal facilities. So really a, a full suite of services to all the sectors that are out there. And then, and then they're um, required as well too, where the services overlap, um, Burlington, uh, that, to coordinate that delivery. And they, they've been really quite, I, I think from the outside perspective, they've, they've come a long way at, at, um, at uh, coordinating those, those delivery services. So there are um, uh, the three year performance targets I, I, I talked about in their plans. They've got minimum <laughs> spending and equity requirements. For, for all sectors that um, both BED and EBT need to address as, as part of their plan and delivery process. So what does this look like in terms of funding? Um, so these are all funded by electric rate payers through this energy efficiency charge um, or EEC on, on the bills. Uh, efficiency Vermont is the lion's share of the budget. So over these three years, 2018, 19, and 20, uh, Efficiency Vermont's um, um, spending on this is, is about $51 um, million. BEDs is about two and a half million. Uh, so together combined, they're about $54, um, $54 million a year for, for the electrical efficiency um, charges. So in addition to those programs offered by BED and, um, and Efficiency Vermont, there are three, uh, they categorize them customer programs. So these, these are really for um, commercial entities um, that um, uh, don't want to be paying the charge uh, to Efficiency Vermont or want a different way of, of applying that charge. And, and so they're, uh, and I can't tell you a lot about the, the, the subtle details of these three programs, but they are, they are somewhat the descriptions of them are, are, um, are, are somewhat unique. So the Self-Managed Energy Efficiency Program or SMEEP, I guess one would call it. Uh, so this allows certain, trend, this is really designed for transmission and industrial uh, customers. So these are the big players. So they can be exempt from paying the energy efficiency charge um, as long as they uh, commit to a minimum annual investment in energy efficiency over a three year period. So this is sort of a negotiated arrangement with these, with these big players uh, under this self-managed program. The energy savings account program um, is for customers who, uh, who pay at least $5,000 a year in the energy efficiency charge. And so they can, they can uh, apply to the PUC or the commission to self-administer their programs. Um, 
And so there's a review process and, and, um, uh, and a negotiated arrangement where, where those, those big, big um, business cu customers can, um, can, can um, self-administer. And then there's a customer credit program, which is um, a design for commercial and industrial customers, uh, meet certain standards, use most of their energy efficiency charge to implement um, savings measures on their own as a substitute for participation in efficiency Vermont programs. Um, and so um, th those are out there and available and, um, and, and uh, for really the largest um, uh, commercial customers. Uh, Lisa, sure Macy, quick, yeah. quick question on those three um, customer programs. Do you have any idea what the uh, uptake has been in those categories? I, I don't. I'm, I, okay. I'm not. My focus has really been primarily on the residential sector, so I, I yeah. couldn't tell you a lot about. Okay, no problem. So the, the, the Public Service Department or the PUC, I'm sure next time they're in, if this is of interest, they, they, I'm sure they have this broken down in, in detailed budgets that they review annually. And then there's the, um, the last one on the electrical side is the, is the uh, SEMP program, not to be confused with the school, uh, schools program, which was the uh, same, same acronym, but this is a state energy management program. Um, now this has really been a successful program that's really been funded through Efficiency Vermont. There's no sort of additional budget for this. It's, it's been sort of a partnership between Efficiency Vermont and uh, the, the um, Department of Buildings and, and General Services, BGS. So they've leveraged uh, technical expertise and, uh, and funding from Efficiency Vermont to really develop sort of a, a, a performance contracting model. Um, so they've sort of in, internalized this process. Many performance contracting models are a third party comes to a big user and offers to pay for the capital cost of measures up front with the arrangement that they get paid back from savings over time. Um, but they also they all take a profit by, by, by doing that. So this, this model really sort of um, maximizes the, the rate of return or the benefit to taxpayers by, by using uh, uh, leveraging capital and, and um, making those investments in, in state, uh, state buildings. Um, and so the, while this has been successful in, internally, so that the, they, for a number of buildings, are really looking to expand this and accelerate it to, to state buildings and facilities, um, but then also to expand this model um, to the mush market, the municipal, university, schools, and hospitals communities as well too. So um, this is, this is um, uh, we'll, we'll be hearing more about this, this effort because it's been successful and it seems to be a, a, a good model and a partnership between the state and efficiency Vermont. So uh, those are the electrical programs. I'm gonna move now to the thermal efficiency programs. And, and these really are about um, uh, fuels that, that we use to generate heat. For, so for heating in hot, hot water um, um, and um, primarily. So, the one biggest one um, that we're aware uh, that, that, that you're probably most aware of is Vermont Gas Systems. Uh, while they've been offering uh, energy efficiency services for more than 20 years, um, five or six years ago, they, they were appointed as the third energy efficiency utility by the uh, Public Utilities Commission. Um, so for, for its service territory, uh, you'll typically hear that we have the state as three energy efficiency utilities two electric and, and one gas and Vermont gas is, is flash. One that offers residential and commercial services for new and existing buildings to their customers. Um, and just for context in, in 2018, they, they performed uh, services on about 165 buildings representing 204 units. And I've got some more data as well too. I'll, I'll, I'll walk through for some of the other ones. Um, quick question on uh, the Funding for the VGS work, uh, do they call it an energy efficiency charge and include it in their bill just the same sort of way that the electric companies' utilities do? Uh, they, they, they basically internalize the cost. Um, so whether while on our uh, electric bills, the, the energy efficiency charge is broken out as a line item, I don't think that that's the case for VGS. I don't know for sure, but my... Um, maybe somebody here is a VGS customer. I am not, but I believe that it's just an internalized cost that that is uh, included in the cost of delivering gas. 
Um, okay. But it is paid for similarly. There, there is a, every customer pays a fee to have these services available. Thank you. Um, on the residential side, um, they're, they're, they really sort of break down uh, customers between higher density users and, and lower density users. So um, it gets, this gets a little wonky, but um, because they have measured fuel usage for, for all their customers, they can look at, and they've got uh, house building size as well too. They, they look at um, those that use more than 50,000 BTUs per square foot per year for heating, and they provide a, a suite of, of sort of more comprehensive services, including audits, rebates, uh, zero and low interest loans, uh, and then equipment replacement as well too. So re rebates for, for heating and hot water equipment. And then for lower density customers, those that aren't using as much per square foot per year, um, they get a, a, an audit, sort of a, a, a less intense walkthrough and uh, referrals to um, Efficiency Vermont's Home Performance with Energy Star program. So this is the residential program that EBT offers statewide on a market rate um, basis. There's some incentives uh, available from Vermont Gas if you do it, but it's not nearly as, as rich a set of incentives as the high users in the Vermont Gas territory. So, so somebody can participate in EBT's program. They co like BED, they coordinate as well too, but, um, but, but they, they don't, they don't uh, provide as, as um, rich incentives as, um, as for the high users. So these, in terms of cost, these, the comprehensive audits and weatherization typically cost somewhere um, you know, for, for, the, for what they invest in these properties, somewhere between $1,500 and, and $6,000. I, I do have some uh, numbers for uh, 2018 that I'll be sharing in a minute. Um, so if the, and, the, and then heating, heating systems as well too, if they're replaced would be on top of this weatherization work. Um, they also work with the Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunities, CVOEO that administers the low income weatherization program for those lower income customers. On the commercial side, um, this sound will be sound similar, equipment replacement, retrofit program, free audits, technical assistance, low, lower zero interest loans, um, and rebates for certain equipment. So in terms of funding, uh, so this gets to your question specifically, uh, Senator Bray. So uh, an energy efficiency charge on natural gas ratepayer bills, uh, PUC reviews that um, based on the three year uh, DRP, demand resource plan uh, proceedings. Uh, and as well, this is, includes, as I mentioned before, the department's evaluation activities are, are paid for on both sides. But BGS's uh, annual expenses are about uh, three and a half million dollars. So compare that to Efficiency Vermont, which is about 50 something million and, and BED, which is about uh, two million. So a little bit more than, than uh, BED, but, but both still quite a bit less than Efficiency Vermont's. Okay. Um, and just as a note, uh, I received a message about the uh, energy efficiency how do they collect that money? It is like on the electric bills called out as a separate EEC okay, on you. the bill, which seems like a plus because it makes what's going on more transparent to everybody. Great, well, thanks for that clarification. Yep. Um, so besides Vermont gas on the thermal side, um, uh, Efficiency Vermont and BED do also provide thermal programs. And so this gets a little confusing at time because you think about them as the, the electric efficiency utilities, but they also provide thermal programs as well too. Uh, so you, the legislature in 2010, um, uh, directed that any revenues that come to the state from the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative and, um, and Vermont's uh, savings from participation in the forward capacity market or, or FCM. So REGI and FCM, all those funds have been directed to Efficiency Vermont and BED for their delivered fuels energy efficiency services. So that, that, that makes up, um, th th those are the funding sources, not from rate payers on the bill, but, but from these other sources to operate these, uh, these thermal programs. So uh, these go to fund weatherization services um, offered to homeowners. Um, so for, for existing homes, I mentioned the Home Performance with Energy Star program is sort of the flagship effort there. Um, and, and, um, and then owners of small businesses, multifamily, residential properties, and mixed use buildings. Um, 
And so this really works with our, our um, network of contractors, the home performance contractors throughout the state. Um, and Efficiency Vermont has, has really sort of, with some funding from Act 62 last year, they've been able to boost their training and uh, efforts and recruitment of contractors. Um, so while uh, went on the, the Efficiency Vermont's list of, of qualified contractors this weekend, there, there are 58 there. Uh, they, they indicated that um, uh, 17 of these were added over the last couple of years with Act 62 funding support as well too. Um, they also used some of that, that boost of funds from last year to really increase um, participation in this program um, through uh, richer incentives. So um, targeted towards lower income Vermonters, but, but really uh, almost uh, more than, I'd have to look at the numbers, but more than doubled their participation from, from previous years um, through the additional Act 62 funding as in addition to the REGI and poor capacity. So again, where there's overlap, EBT and BED coordinate these programs um, and they also coordinate with monies and uh, that are available through the electrical uh, energy efficiency charge. So they can, they can roll by having these uh, single entities working with customers, they can roll and pull in um, funding from multiple programs to offer those to customers and have it be a seamless, seamless offer so that customers don't have to navigate um, which funding source or which place to go to. But like, this is part of the, the point made in the Act 62 report that we really do have this robust ecosystem of, of um, uh, programs and, and uh, delivery infrastructure in the state already. Um, Richard, can I add a note on that last? So the weatherization services, particularly when they're oriented to thermal, I mean, I think some people might argue, and let me just check this with you, that that could be interpreted as offering sort of a cross subsidy, that you are taking energy uh, electrical dollars and applying them to a thermal load that may be met entirely through a non-electrical fuel. Is that, is that a fair sort of concern to people to flag I think that's been a concern from the beginning, but I think that, um, and because of those concerns, uh, my understanding is that um, the utilities really do a, a great job at um, reporting and sort of parsing out where the funding is coming from and how it's being spent uh, to, to overcome those, those concerns that the regulators have. Okay, so, great. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I really, I mean, you could look at it the other way too, we're, we're piggybacking on the opportunity to be in a home anyhow for, for one purpose and, and able to, to avoid having to pay two visits or two sets of administrative costs or recruitment and, and leveraging uh, the, the, the funding from, from, um, from both, you know, from multiple sources. Sure. And I know that when we did the Act 62 work last year where we allowed more E electrical energy efficiency charge dollars to be applied in the thermal and transportation side. It's a modest portion of their budget and it was really to prime the pump. And I just want to yep. yep. call out that we're, we're not interested in having electricity be the only horse in harness for each fuel type should be a horse in harness pulling its own efficiency program. But this was a way to whatever i'm gonna this met metaphor is gonna end soon you know get the wagon moving uh so yeah. senator mcdonald just um mr chair you're you're exactly correct in that we did take some money from efficiency vermont electric to prime the pump for thermal work in um in homes and now we have by putting training people to go on staff and be available to perform those tasks so we have a we have invested in a primed pump, but we're not pushing any more water through this larger pump that we've installed. We're, it's not being used. And um, the, the house proposal last year that we didn't accept of a couple cents on um, tax that was exempt from agriculture and a bunch of other stuff. And the PUC's recommendation that we got on Friday, um, don't use this pump, it, it, it's just, you know, we're, we still have not gotten off the ball to um, take advantage of the monies spent in the last year 
as the witness has characterized the purpose of those monies. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. And I think, you know, uh, it's a, my sense is a pretty well shared goal of this committee to, to make more use of that pump this, this year. Um, my second question, which we may get to is um, the, to the being measuring the economic benefit to the state of Vermont by not shipping money out of state to buy fossil fuel products and how to, to when we're making these considerations, say, um, or critics would say, well, you're spending more tax money and economists would say you're spending more tax money, but the amount of local um, economic growth or activity that is generated by this spending also has to be calculated. And it, I don't see those calculations. Uh, Chamber of Commerce gives them Gives us and gives us those calculations over and over again from everybody that comes in and you know, rents in a hotel room or buys a meal, but we never get them for um, money that's brought back into the state when we do not purchase these products from out of state. You know, there's there's there uh, there is a great um, piece of work that was done this fall by um, uh, DECD uh, Economic Development and the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, an analysis using REMI modeling on exactly uh, that issue, Senator McDonald, and, and the, the multiplier effects of, of um, investing in, in weatherization rather than sending that money out of state. And you, you may benefit from uh, somebody um, speaking to that report if you, if you haven't already. Well, perhaps, it's coming uh, in. perhaps this afternoon, Mr. Chair, we'll, we'll get that as part of our uh, budgetary message to the state. I look forward to it. Sure. Um, actually, department is scheduled to come in and go through that report, uh, Mr. Fazy, tomorrow morning. Oh, so they're on, our, they're on our schedule. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, I'll move on unless there are other questions. Um, so the uh, continuing on the, the thermal efficiency and process fuels, um, these programs are provided by, to, to both sectors, residential and commercial. Um, new, so um, on the new construction side as well too. So if you're building a new home or building a new business, um, these, there are um, the funding that comes in from Reggie and FCM along with uh, combined with the electrical funding helps um, to ensure that the, the, the construction that is being built is to the highest level and is cost effective. Um, Efficiency Vermont also funds some of the, the business existing facilities programs um, uh, with some of this funding as well too. So there's a list of, of um, snowmaking, maple, maple sap, um, controls, ventilation, HVAC system, uh, et cetera. Uh, efficient products programs as well too. So there's heat pumps, thermostats, the storm windows. Um, and so while, um, uh, BE, while uh, Efficiency Vermont uh, it has a pretty robust program statewide, BED's uh, potential is somewhat limited because their territory significantly overlaps with Vermont gases and these thermal efficiency process funds are really are, are actually prohibited from being used for regulated fuels. Um, so for, for um, uh, can't be used for Vermont gas, uh, saving of Vermont gas fuels because Vermont gas is responsible for those in their service, service territories and they overlap there. But, but BED is allowed to use them for uh, supporting district heating, which, um, uh, which has been an, a long standing effort in, in Vermont looking at the McNeil wood generating plants. And, and so uh, while I'm not sure the details of that, I, I do know there's, there's quite a bit of activity um, uh, hoped for to, to grow out that, that, uh, that effort. So in terms of budgets for the thermal efficiency um, process fuel uh, for the past three years, for, uh, for 2018, 2019, and, and 2020, uh, about, uh, about nine or $10 million a year from Efficiency Vermont and uh, significantly less, uh, 100,000 from BED. So about $10 million a year combined efforts uh, between the, the, those two utilities on the thermal process side. So the weatherization assistance program. Um, so moving um, on to the utilities. 
Uh, Richard? This is a, 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 the state's um, uh, significant- Mr. Fahey? Effort. Yes. Uh, sorry. Um, we've been going uh, a little more than 90 minutes straight. So I would propose that we just take, it's 11.07. We just go to 11.15, give people a moment to get up, move around a little bit, then we'll sit down and go right through, uh, we'll finish out the morning. That sounds great. I've got a couple thermal programs left and then there's a, a natural break. So um, how about if we do that? Okay, sure. Okay. Um, so WAP, or the Weatherization Assistance Program. Uh, this is uh, administered by the Office of Economic Opportunity. And really uh, uh, it's a program that, that is operated in all 50 states uh, and there are rules from the US Department of Energy um, that, that dictate some of the, or most of the details of, of how this is administered in terms of cost effectiveness and testing and, um, and what their money can be used for. So uh, this is free services that are available to qualifying low-income Vermonters and, and that threshold is uh, set at uh, less than 80% of the state median income. So if you, if you make less than 80%, you are eligible um, to receive these services. Um, when you get these services is, is, a, is a question. There's, there's a priority, prioritization um, uh, ranking system that's in place. And based on the funding that they have available um, and the need, um, I, I just know from personal experience in helping a couple elderly um, disabled folks in Starksboro where I live, it, it, can, it can take quite a while to actually, uh, by the time you get on the list to actually get to providing services, there are a lot of priority um, projects and people in the state. And, and I think it's a function of, it's a function of both um, budget and, and workforce as well too. So we had, um, we had a little uh, back of the napkin data last session on it. If you, based on Department of Taxes assessment of the total number of filers who would be eligible based on income, that if you took that, that number and divided by how many we're doing in an average year, it would be a 52 year waiting list. So oh, there you go. Um, yes. big there's a big opportunity to get to more people sooner. Yeah, it, 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 it took, you know, for the couple that we worked with on our energy committee, it, it was um, be between a year and a half and, and two years before they're able to, to provide service. So, um, so these are operated um, by the four community action programs uh, around the state and, and the Northeast Employment Training Organization, or NEDO. So there are five organizations that actually administer that, um, and, and each has their own crew, weatherization crew, but then also have um, um, contractors in the market that they rely on to provide these services. Um, VGS, Efficiency Vermont, and, and BED also provide additional funding. Um, there's some, ni some nice overlap. If, if um, uh, one of the WAP agencies is going to do weatherization work, there's opportunity to save electricity, then there's some funding that can come in from, from Efficiency Vermont, uh, or if there's overlapping in territories, um, there's some, some good coordination between, uh, between those programs to make sure that the electrical and natural gas um, resources are, are maximized. Um, so they do, WAP does about 900 of these projects a year. So that's, that's your, um, you know, you take your, uh, at, at the current rate, uh, that's where your 52 years of waiting list uh, com comes in. Um, they, they do a good job. Uh, their average house uh, saves about 25% after they're, they're done, um, saves about 1.8 tons of, of emissions annually. Um, the cost, the numbers here are, um, uh, they, the, the cost is about uh, $8,500 is what came out of the PC report. But in a different table, uh, I, I saw that their average is about $10,500 per home. So I'm not quite sure what's, the right right number. There's a couple different sources there, but it's somewhere in you know somewhere uh, close to or plus or minus ten thousand dollars per home is what they spend. Um, sure. um, uh, and we're going to towards the, the non non energy um, health and safety measures in the homes, which is an important benefit. Right, right, and we're going to have those folks in this week as well. So uh, we'll hear from them at this week and next. We'll be visiting with the individual actors. Um, and who knows, maybe the answer is that if 85 is the energy cost and that's 20%, then 
they, they would be your extra 2000 to bring you to 10. Right, and it, it could also be that the, the total cost includes admin costs as well too, and probably some evaluation and reporting. So that, that could, when you divide the total cost of the program by the number of homes, it goes up to 10.5. So okay. that could be it. So the funding is, as um, Matt Coda indicated earlier, comes from uh, a, a, a number of sources. So there's a two cents per gallon fuel tax on oil, propane, and kerosene. There's a gross receipts tax on natural gas uh, and coal, and then a separate half a percent gross receipts tax on electricity. Um, and there's also uh, additional, um, uh, actually, I, I believe, Matt, you probably correct me, I think dye diesel is part of, uh, part of the fuel tax as well too, which I don't, which I don't have listed in here, but that, that, that is, is part of this, and we had that conversation earlier. Um, and then there's additional funding that comes from the US DOE that goes to every state based on population and need. So, but in Vermont, we would have, we would have really this, a skeleton of a program if we relied only on the million, 1.1 uh, 1, 1. 1 to 1.4 million that came from the DOE. Uh, we raised 10 times that through these other uh, in-state taxes. So we're able to, um, to have a $10 million program a year for, for the most needy people rather than a, a $1 million a year. Program. So this is really a, a beneficial service to, to low income people. And the last thermal uh, uh, program before our break is the Clean Energy Development Fund. Um, so this you probably know, you probably talked about this quite a bit in the past. It's really, uh, uh, it's really on its way out because there hasn't been recent funding, but it has been focused on advanced wood heating initiatives, focused on uh, pellet, wood, pellet boilers, uh, for both residential and, and commercial institutional, and then, and then um, change out of non-certified old wood stoves as well too. Um, there's, there's also uh, grants that are available on, to this, on the supply side to help uh, support a local pulp, um, bulk pellet heating market. So for those um, entities that are looking into uh, developing um, an infrastructure of, of pellets, um, there, there is some funding there. But as I mentioned, um, the, the 1.2 million that was available for FY 2020 uh, is really the end of the program as far as I understand it, that, that there's no dedicated funding available at this point in time. Um, there is some recycled funds from uh, ERA, uh, ERA um, um, loan fund that's being recycled. Um, and, and part of this is administered again, here's another leveraging um, uh, example, CDF is working cooperatively with Efficiency Vermont's existing homes program um, and delivering the, the message and the incentives through those existing relationships with, um, with market players. So um, I'll stop there if there are any questions and we can come back and uh, I'll look a little bit at some of the data and, and what, what the impact these programs have, have had. Okay. So I have 11.15 on my clock here. Why don't we uh, reconvene at 11.20, just to give people a chance to stand up. Uh, we've been sitting for quite a while. All right. And I'll remind everyone, we're gonna continue to stream. So I'm reminding myself as much as anyone else, you may want to mute and stop your
Go away, Chris. It's only eleven nineteen. <laughs> uh, yeah, figured I better um, I better behave myself and get here a minute early. <laughs> yeah. All right, now it's eleven twenty. All right, <laughs> and there it goes. All right. Turning control back over to Richard. I mean, that's amazing. I, it's, I saw Senator Campion in jogging attire go past my house during that short break, and now he's already dressed and back at his desk. Amazing. Uh, um, so, Richard, you wanted, uh, are you set up to screen share again and continue it was, on? It was, at, I, I need to be uh, given permission to do so again if Jude is able to do that. Did that work? And yes, it did. Me has kept me in exile. Great. But it's beyond a rough. Thank you. Okay. So, um, some of the program results as the um, just get over there. Um, so, a lot of data here. Um, and, uh, but I just wanna point out a, a couple, uh, couple elements here. So this, this table comes out of um, one of those data sources I mentioned uh, earlier from the, from the PUC. This is a summary of, of the um, uh, economic impact of weatherization modeling. Um, uh, and so across the top, we have the, um, the efficiency utilities and, and, and then so BED and EBT and BGS. In addition in here is um, 3E Thermal. Um, so 3E Thermal is um, one of the programs that is, is offered um, through Efficiency Vermont in partnership with um, at least Capstone. I'm not exactly sure how, what, the, what the arrangement is, but focus on rental multifamily buildings. Um, so it sort of falls underneath the funding uh, funding comes from the efficiency Vermont effort, um, but but um, so th these are basically residential units. Uh, so the 169 um, here, this is for data from 2018, so it's a couple years old. But but these are all multifamily units. But if you uh, if you add up all of the residential units across the top, we're we're about 971 units in the market market rate uh, programs at that year, and then plus the uh, Low-income OEO weatherization programs. Uh, I said about 900 a year. It goes up or down. In that particular year, it was it was 800. So we're a little less. Uh, this this past year, with your Act Act um, 62 funding, um, the number of EBT projects went uh, up quite a, quite a bit. Basically, double uh, double the number here. So we're cl getting closer to 2,000. Uh, units a year between uh, low income and, and market rate this, this past year. But it's somewhere somewhere split between market rate and OEO and about 2,000 a year, sort of walking around numbers. But with incentive, with money that can be spent by incentives, I think EBT really proved that uh, you could really boost the market with, with having, having additional funds to be able to put out there to, to, to drive people's interest. Um, I mentioned before as well too, OEO is uh, 29, I think I said 25% savings. This is for one year, that was sort of on average. So we're seeing across these programs, um, 3E Thermal does a really comprehensive job at 52% savings in the, in the apartment um, multifamily buildings they're working at. Um, some of the savings uh, in other programs is a little less, but on average, it's about 24% about savings uh, for, for that particular year. Um, the, uh, and then uh, if we look at, then I, we've added up the, the incentive cost, the participant cost, and the, and the total project cost or the next set of numbers here. So I, I think it's either just look across the bottom row. Total cost per project um, is, is about $9,000. So ranges because of apartment um, units of, of, and, and getting more comprehensive savings is gonna cost more than, than um, a high user in, in VGS's territory. But on average, about about nine or ten thousand dollars, and th these numbers have been 
um, I think are around there. We've been seeing them for quite a few years. On the, um, on the OEO side, mentioned before, um, I, was, I was wrong. I said ten and a half thousand dollars per project. It was, um, the, 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 um, it, it's twelve and a half thousand dollars here. So the difference between the 8,500 savings per, per home is probably, you're probably right. Um, somebody could correct, correct me on this. It's probably health and safety. It could be admin costs and other things as well too. But we're looking at ten or twelve thousand dollars on average for these for these homes. And there's a lot of detail behind all this. I think the the one thing I want to point out too is that this ten um, ten thousand dollar cost per project on the market rate. If you look at the incentive costs of about um, one point six million and the participant costs of about seven point one million, we're leveraging more than five to one by providing incentive. So. Um, uh, so, so I think that's an important, uh, important point that the, the money that we put in these programs leverages private capital and, and uh, customer and uh, investment and, and lending uh, at, at greater than a five to one ratio. So I think that's, uh, that, that's something to keep in mind. Um, so I, this is just a little more detail in terms of the providers we've looked at. So BED, EBT, 3E Thermal, uh, Office of Economic Opportunity, BGS, and then overall for, for four program years, 2015 through 2018, what percent savings they're generating. So as I mentioned before, uh, three thermal uh, sort of leads the way, they also in invest more. So you, you invest more in these projects, you get more savings. Um, uh, and and you know, this is around the 25% the uh, on average uh, savings. And you, you can see it's creeping up Towards, towards 30 in 2018, but it goes up and down based on, on the projects that are out there. Um, so what does this look like over time? Uh, well, if you look at the cumulative impact of, of, uh, of this work, it looks pretty impressive. Um, so we're from 20, 2009 up to, up to um, 2019, uh, we're, we're getting close to 30,000 homes. Um, and you can see, uh, EVTs uh, been growing. OEO has been sort of consistently providing, adding homes to the mix. Uh, 3E Thermal has, has grown over time, and, and BGS has, has as well. They've all they've all sort of added added more um, more homes and, and made some good progress. But when you look at it on a um, on an annual basis, not cumulative, um, we're actually going down from our, our peak uh, peak number of homes that we did um, 10 years ago. So we're not heading in the right direction on a year over year basis to Senator McDonald's point earlier about, about uh, needing to, to, to scale things up. Um, so I think that that was really the, uh, what, what I took away from, from this, we're, we're still making, you know, we're still doing about 2000 homes a year, but we need to be doing uh, in the next table will show quite a few more than that. So sorry, there are a lot of numbers here. I'll try to explain this one. This is the completed retrofitted units um, versus the goals that we have. And the goals have sort of been what, what we've been uh, oriented towards and, and want to make sure we keep an eye on. So this comes from a, a PUC annual report on uh, um, progress towards, towards fitness goals. So the, from, um, from 20, uh, 2008 through 2013, uh, and then, and then uh, are lumped together, and then uh, annually each year through 2019 after that. So the goals across this top row, um, we're, we were to be doing um, you know, 17,000, which is where we started, but about eight or 10,000, up to 12,000 homes a year through 2017. And then we could reach our goals by steadying, by leveling off at about 7,000 homes after that. Um, cumulatively, uh, if you add those up, we should, in 2019, we should have weatherized 73,000 homes. And you saw from the previous chart that we've actually only weatherized about 30,000 or this row cumulative completion. So the, the goal of 73,000 less the uh, cumulative completions puts us at 44,000 homes behind goal. Um, so we've got, we've got some ground to make up. Um, so we're, we're only doing about 2,000 homes a year. We need to be ramping up to somewhere to catch up uh, somewhere between um, 12 to 15,000 homes a year. Um, that's not going to happen overnight. It's, it's going to need to uh, entail workforce development, training. Um, we've got to build the market to demand all this. Um, that, so this is a, this is a, we're in a deep hole 
um, if we're going to try to make those 2030 goals. We've got to make up the 44,000 homes we're behind and get back on track for doing uh, 10 or 10 or 10,000 or seven to 10,000 homes a year. So uh, we've got some ground to make up. Nice. Um, so uh, the one electrification program uh, I'm going to focus on sort of uh, just because it's, it's, it's in a different bucket the way that um, uh, the regulatory environment works. So this is, I'm sure you're well aware of the tier three program. So this is tier three of the uh, Vermont Renewable Energy Standard. Uh, the first tier being utility scale, utility generation. This has really been a successful electrical initiative in, in um, making our electric supply cleaner. Uh, tier two is making sure that uh, a certain percentage of that electricity that we get is produced in Vermont um, at, at, at a smaller scale than just utility scale generation. And tier three, which is the, which impacts what we're talking about here today, buildings and um, and transforming from uh, from delivered fuels to uh, clean electricity is is tier three. So this requires um, savings uh, the utilities to actually deliver savings of, uh, of a couple of years ago, starting in 2017, and then a few years after that for municipal utilities, to save 2% of, of the utilities retail sales um, in um, megawatt hour equivalents. But basically uh, transferring, um, trying to be cognizant of, of Matt code as fuel switching um, suggestion, but um, of, of a trend, in, in some cases uh, it would be fuel switching, in other cases it's saving uh, delivered fuels and transitioning to, um, to electricity. So uh, each year, an additional two thirds of percent uh, is added to that previous year's goal to transform projects uh, 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 from those that use fossil fuels to those that use electricity. Um, and as well too, if the tier two um, uh, renewable generation is above what's required, they can also apply uh, that amount of, of clean energy towards their tier three goals. So this is a growing, uh, this program as I, I feel like it's, it's um, uh, been picking the low hanging fruit over the last couple of years, it's gonna become increasingly challenging in the out years uh, for the electric utilities to find um, uh, viable projects. And so this is just uh, an, an opportunity to keep in mind because we'll be, while, be, while big projects will, uh, will have been funded and, and um, addressed early on, uh, there's going to be more and more, more uh, search for viable projects uh, going forward. Uh, so these costs are embedded in, in the distribution utility rate. So there isn't a separate fund for this. So where has this been used? Uh, the bulk of the uh, tier three projects have been in line extensions. Um, so a lot of these are things like uh, maple sugaring operations that historically had had burned diesel in their uh, in their generators because uh, it was too expensive to run electric lines in, or sawmills that had uh, diesel-powered um, generators or, or, um, or sawing equipment. So extending extending lines in, no making compressors, um, uh, uh, cold climate heat pump programs, um, Green Mountain Power and Vermont Electric Co-op and others that certainly have, have been promoting the, the heat pump and, and claiming the savings through this initiative, both on the CNI side and uh, and on the residential, and then a number of other efforts as well too, battery storage, electric vehicle supply, electric vehicles, pellet stoves, and a little slice of weatherization, 2% 2, 2 here. Um, my, my contention, and then some other custom projects. My contention is as this program uh, advances uh, and the goals increase each year, there's gonna be more and more opportunity to look at weatherization as, as um, something for the utilities to potentially fund through this effort. But that hasn't, hasn't quite happened yet. And finally, uh, there are a couple cross-cutting programs. Um, so building energy standards are really, are, are, is, is another name for codes, energy codes in Vermont. So we've got a, a residential um, building energy standard, RBs and commercial CBs. We've had these in place for, for quite a while. They're both based on a, a, an international energy code. Every three years, the state is required to update the codes and go through a, a stakeholder process. Um, but as you're probably well aware of, because there's no statewide mechanism for enforcement, um, these standards may not always be implemented. So there's quite a bit of activity. The 
Home Builders and Remodelers Association is, is in, in, in support of uh, builder registry and some other efforts to, to um, level the playing field for all builders around enforcement for these codes. Um, there's also a residential stretch code, which is a higher code than the base that went into effect uh, in 2015. Um, it applies to all Act 250 projects and can also be adopted by municipalities. I know that some, um, there have been a handful that have considered, considered this, um, and there's some that may have uh, the stretch code in place. Um, and then as well, too, there's a commercial stretch code guidelines uh, that, that have been developed for as part of the commercial Act 250 project. Uh, the funding for this comes through uh, a DOE uh, annual allocation that the uh, Department of Public Service receives from the state energy programs. Um, and then as well, too, Efficiency Vermont supports these efforts through their Energy Code Assistance Center. Um, they do trainings and, and, uh, and develop materials for municipalities and, and, and others on the set. So an another sort of interwoven network uh, of, of, of our e ecosystem. Um, and I think this might be the last. Uh, okay, so uh, two, two, two programs left uh, and then conclusions. Um, so the LIHE program, Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, you may be well familiar with this. This is our, uh, a, a national program uh, funding, federal funding comes from every state based on, uh, on population and other formula um, to assist low income homeowners in meeting their immediate home uh, energy needs. Um, so in our state, cooling isn't as, as much of an issue as, as it is in other, other places, but this money can be used for, uh, to, to cover energy bills, for heating and cooling, for energy crisis, and for weatherization and, and some um, minor uh, home repairs related to that. So Agency of Human Services administers this. And it's available to people who are at or less than 185% of federal po poverty level. Um, historically, Vermont has allocated 0% of LIHEAP funds to weatherization, but that's changed in recent years. And the, the most recent um, plan uh, includes 15% of LIHEAP funds um, uh, allocated to uh, Vermont uh, Weatherization Assistance Program funding. So Vermont gets about $20 million a year from the feds for, for LIHEAP. Uh, uh, and then finally, the energy assistance programs, the utilities, have uh, these programs that they've been operating, at least uh, there may be others, but at least Green Mountain Power and BGS provide programs that help, help uh, lower income Vermonters afford their energy needs. Um, and so uh, for those who make less than 150% uh, of the poverty level, they get a discount on their, on their bills. Um, for BGS, that threshold is a little higher. Um, and so th this is, this is uh, uh, paid for by, by customers involved into the rates for each of those utilities. So um, with, with that, I've got a couple just uh, final, final remarks here and, and some recommendations. This is probably a, a table. I'm sorry, it's probably hard to see on a smaller, a smaller screen, but you've probably seen this before. The Energy Action Network uh, puts this together uh, annually in, in their uh, annual report. Um, it sort of um, uh, spells out what the state would need to do to meet our Paris Agreement commitments uh, and broken it into the, the green bars or our transportation, thermal that we're talking about today are, are the orange bars and electricity is 16%. So if we're gonna meet, meet those goals, um, we've, got to, we've got to electrify a lot of vehicles, um, but on the thermal side, we've got to add 90,000 heat pumps, 25,000 advanced wood heating systems, um, uh, we've got to retrofit 90,000 additional homes and add another 90,000 heat pump uh, water heaters. So there's, there's a lot of, of work to be done if indeed we're going to uh, meet our, our Paris commitment. So um, with that, uh, Act 62, you've already uh, heard from the PUC on this. So I'll just go through this quickly. The findings findings, and then Senator Bray outlined uh, these at the beginning of, of the uh, hearing today. So um, that uh, clear evidence is clear and unrebutted that without additional funding, um, we're, we're not going to meet our not going to meet our goals. Uh, I, I don't think that's news to anybody. Um, if we're going to make meaningful progress uh, and commitments, we'll need to identify uh, appropriate, stable, robust funding and programs 
uh, outside of traditionally regulated sectors. So that was the preliminary report last, last year. The final report that just came out um, a couple of weeks ago, the four major recommendations, um, uh, so TCI, uh, which I'm, I'm not really addressing here today, but uh, collecting a thermal efficiency benefit charge in the sale of fuel oil, propane, and kerosene. We'll see that they uh, they don't mention dye diesel, which is which to, to Matt's earlier um, 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 uh, acknowledgement of uh, of them getting it right. Uh, gradually, gradually increasing the fuel tax to benefit more low-income Vermonters and supporting the existing ecosystem of program administrators and market actors. Um, don't need a new all fuels efficiency entity. I think hopefully after my presentation today, you'll see we've got, seems like we've got lots of opportunity to build on and, and work from. And so that, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. So finally, I've got a, a, couple, a couple recommendations. Uh, Act 62 report uh, got it mostly right. Uh, their recommendations make, make a lot of sense to me. Uh, I, I think there's an opportunity we heard from Matt to work with the fuel dealers, ad address, address their concerns in return for support uh, of an expanded combined fuel tax that, that grows support for low income weatherization program, market-based weatherization and heating fuel displacement for all income levels. Uh, we clearly need to build up Vermont's workforce, expand the number and skills of weatherization HVAC contractors and, and work on uh, transitioning fuel dealers to, a, to a, a, a new clean energy economy. Uh, expand the, the um, energy efficiency ecosystem to enlist the Vermont Housing and Finance Agency. Um, you'll hear a little bit more about this this afternoon. Um, and uh, they're interested in playing a role in this. They're, they're gonna be a great partner to help provide financing expertise and, and leverage uh, to, to help raise some of this um, multi-million dollars that we're going to need to get the job done. And, and then really, I think that your job as a, as a legislature is to develop a weatherization funding framework that will enable Vermont to, to meet our clean energy goals. So that, that seems to me like um, what, what could be a really productive outcome of this legislative session is to put in place um, that framework and that mechanism to, to enable this to happen. So with that, that's Sorry, that was a lot and, and long, but um, I think we got it covered. Yep, um, no apologies needed. That was great. Very helpful to just the, the right level of comprehensiveness with enough depth to help us really know uh, enough to really dig in further as we work through. So uh, to Richard and anyone listening and the committee, um, we're going to be hearing from those actors in that ecosystem in the coming uh, the balance of this week and into next and start to um, dig in. And I, you know, the, um, I'll say a little something about the, that final recommendation about uh, funding, f funding framework. So um, there are quite a few fees that already exist. You know, we might be thinking about rationalizing them. We may, there's, We've talked about, and we'll be hearing more about different ways to raise money, for instance, through bonding. Um, I just wanna emphasize that the, this big picture that we talked briefly about, you know, 120,000 homes in a decade, um, there is a temptation on the part of some to just jump to the cost of doing the work without ever pausing to acknowledge the benefits delivered. And I think that's just, a, uh, you know, for all of us, um, it seems to be human nature to focus on cost, but uh, you know, I would reframe that as saying that cost should be considered uh, you know, relative to um, how we're doing things now. It's always a cost compared to what. So for instance, if you hear uh, you know, something like a billion dollars over a decade, that, that is no two ways about it, a big number, but it, the business as usual model has us spending roughly $20 billion on energy uh, sourcing. So it, I just wanna help us not have uh, the benefit side of things uh, put on the table when we also look at the, the cost. And I think that'll be part of our work as a committee to develop a coherent whole and balanced picture to share with our colleagues as we get ready to make recommendations. Um, 
And then I think, you know, another thing that hasn't come up yet, and I don't know how this would work. So this is a very genuine question on my part. If we are going to be influencing a collection of money from different players and actors and facilitating, um, how do we structure something so that as money arrives, it's received and then allocated um, to the most uh, cost-effective projects? Uh, and um, so that we, ha we can, as uh, we meet a fiduciary responsibility as a legislature, whether it's ratepayer dollars, taxpayer dollars, we know we need to know that when we influence that system, we are making smart choices and we then need to be accountable for the outcomes, the performance of that system and be able to report out the citizens at large into the legislature. So I don't really see yet how um, we create uh, the, quite the appropriate level of review to see how to do it for this whole ecosystem. Um, a model that's already in this ecosystem is, for instance, on the Efficiency Vermont work, uh, the department and the PUC play roles in uh, keeping an eye on that system and helping make allocations, smart allocations. Uh, maybe that's something we build on, maybe not, I don't know. We'll be asking both the department and the PUC that question, but I just wanted to float that out there. I see those two notes to be uh, for us to really think about carefully and work through um, coming up with solutions in the next uh, several weeks as we keep on working on weatherization. Uh, so with that, let me just check and see if committee has anything they'd like to, you know, certainly want to open the floor to discussion on what we've been talking about this morning. I don't know if people have questions, comments, et cetera. Senator McDonald, you look like you have something. Um, on the final report, there was a transportation recommendation that we go to more electric cars. And it, it, it didn't speak to how do we stop um, purchasing cars that burn more and more, and more fuel. Um, the other one that, that um, is sort of counterintuitive and I, it, it's not meant in any disrespect for, but it was at the very end there about um, if we wanna get support from uh, the fuel dealers for what we're gonna do, um, we need to you know, take into consideration what they are interested in. And I, I just, if the fuel dealers that sell fossil fuels support what we're doing, um, we're doing something wrong. By definition, if they think that, that, that we're doing something that um, gains us their support, um, we're making a mistake. Um, that, that I just can't see any way that, um, that they would be, um, no, I think it speaks for itself. And um, there's no one better than Matt at, at being um, articulate and, um, and, and non-confrontational in his presentations, but um, um, I, you know, so. I, 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 can I address? Yeah, sure. Something to that? Please. Um, yeah, I mean, I, um, I think uh, that there's an opportunity here for for those field dealers who don't want to change. You're absolutely right, Senator McDonald. But for those field dealers who see. Uh, who understand where things are going and um, and have a, 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 a vision for the future in which they remain in business, they're going to have to evolve and change and provide other services. And I, I think uh, Matt and you know I'm not speaking for Matt, but I've heard, heard him say it and I've heard him, his people say, you know that they they evolved from uh, their industry evolved from selling ice and coal, the one that's uh, that's selling. Um, liquid fuels and 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 now transitioning to selling heat pumps and and pellets and we're we're not going to be able to um, support our existing building infrastructure without the fuel dealers. They 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 understand they've got relationships with with um, a residential and commercial businesses. They're in their basements fixing their equipment. Um, they just need to change their business model. Um, I, I think there's a, a real opportunity for, for partnership here. Um, and we just need to figure out what, what, where the common ground lies and work with them to help them transition away from relying on selling 
something we don't want, the fossil fuels, towards something that we, we do want, clean, clean energy and, and service. Um, so um, Matt, Matt can speak to his, his constituency better than I can, but that's my perspective from the outside. It's better than anyone. He, he does a terrific job. I don't agree with him, but. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, you know, so I, 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 Senator McDonald, I take your point well. I don't think this committee runs the danger of having the wool pulled over its eyes, <laughs> nor do I think anyone's interested in pulling the wool over our eyes on, on this one. But I do feel as though the, a goal for me is to find a path forward that brings everyone forward where we try to we try to avoid creating winners and losers and so to the you know another way to look at what we're talking about is that we're we're sending an invitation to the fuel dealers association about how can you participate in heading for the same cleaner energy future that we're i think is a shared uh, interest all the way around the table so um, and we'll we'll all keep our eyes open, you know? And I think that's, that's fair. Um, any other comments or questions? Okay. Um, Mr. Cody, you're sitting here quietly. I don't know if you wanna chime in or please feel free. Well, I, I think Mr. Faisy said it exactly right. Um, there will be companies that transition. We can sell fewer gallons. We have been and we will continue to. Um, but we're not going to go away unless you ban the product we sell. And we advise you not to do that. Um, I, would, uh, I, I would seek to ban the products that, um, that the oil dealers don't sell, but that consume a hell of a lot of oil. Um, and the vehicles that the fuel dealers don't sell, but burn more, um, more gasoline than they need to. And, you know, um, that's... And, and we, Mr. Chair, let legislatures create winners and losers every time they pass bills. That's what we do. We create winners and losers. Um, our policies lead to the, the widening gap between winners of, of uh, high income earners and Losers, uh, low-income earners. When that gap gets each year, that gap gets wider. We are contributing to winners and losers. That's what we do. That's our job. And um, we sometimes try to pretend we don't do that, and then scratch our heads, back to our heads, and say, "How did that happen?" Well, it happened because we sat quietly while winners and losers. Um, relationship between those changed and we did nothing. That's what we do. Okay. Well, it, your um, point's well taken and I hope you'll help us keep our eyes wide open uh, on what we're doing. So I, I always feel like that's one of your jobs in our committee. Um, Senator Westman, anything you wanted to chip in before we sign off this morning? Not really, it's just a lot. Okay. Uh, Senator Campion? No, I don't think so at this point. I thought uh, it was a great overview. I appreciate Richard yep. coming in. Uh, well done. And now on to the work. I guess, you know, it, it's an interesting, um, you know, again, I, I think I just want to go back to something I said earlier and other committee members echoed. This is, of course, incredibly important, but uh, we need to also realize how important our work is with the transportation committee. And I hope that we will indeed start to have um, um, uh, work with them much more closely as we move forward. Yes, thank you. Um, Senator McCormick. Thanks, and I don't think there's time this morning for an answer, but I wanna raise the question and maybe we have something to consider in the future. And it's, it's this, I don't understand the business model for petroleum sellers to, to be selling 
petroleum in the in in, in the future. I, obviously, you're if you're you're into something right now, there's momentum. But it seems to me that that uh, certainly any company manager besides managing their product, they manage mainly they manage money, and you buy the product so you can sell it, and 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 uh, that inventory runs out has to be replenished constantly and uh in the future you could be a quiet you could be buying you could have a different inventory that that's it's not that big a change also equipment becomes obsolete and has to be replaced trucks have to be replaced tanks age out and so on that over i would think that over the long run the selling of energy would transition from the selling of petroleum to the selling of, of, of other forms of energy. I look as a model, and admittedly, the tobacco companies are still selling a lot of tobacco, but it's amazing how much Liggett and Myers owns that has nothing to do with tobacco. You know, that they, they have acquired, they've taken their, their capital and directed it into other investments. And I would think that over the long run, you would see petroleum as obviously something we're into now. You don't stop. You don't just jump off a speeding train. Uh, so I understand that there's momentum, but that over the long, that the long-term planning would be to get off of petroleum altogether. I'm surprised that you said you're never going to stop selling petroleum. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Coda. If, if I may, Senator McCormick, no, you're absolutely right. And it, but remember, we're not a utility it's a disparate group of 110 companies. Uh, some have been, some will last five more years. Some will last 50 more years. The one that last 50 will be selling something in addition to petroleum. And when I say never, I don't mean 100 years from now. We're talking in the in the, the near term, the 10 to 20 year range. Vermonters will still need petroleum to heat their homes and power their vehicles, even if we see exponential growth in electric vehicles and in uh, electric heat pumps and, yes. and, uh, and and wood stoves. However, the most valuable commodity energy company has, and you touched on it, Senator McCormick, for a heating fuel company, the most valuable commodity is not the fuel in the tank that gets replaced. It's the customer list. It's the relationship with the customer that that you have for multi generations. And for a gasoline seller, it's the real estate. It's the corner where people go to buy a loaf of bread or a gallon of milk or a soda or a beer, that's the, that's the commodity, not the fuel that's in the tank. And so those companies will still be around because they'll still have something to sell, whether it's electricity for cars or whether it's a commodity, which is something you yeah. consume. Um, and the heating companies will still be around because they'll be the ones that are fixing the solar panels, the cold climate heat pumps, installing the wood panels and selling renewable liquid fuel. I'm, I'm not such a green fanatic that I don't understand the idea that there's, there's petroleum in the future and it's going to have to be supplied. I do think that there is a point, there's a large gray area where that is not just a matter of recognizing the future. It, it is a self-fulfilling prophecy that, that probably, if, if we'd probably be crazy to just say, okay, no petroleum in 10 years, that would be crazy. But if we're kind of saying, we're gonna to have to have X amount of petroleum in 10 years, we're gonna have that petroleum. I mean, that, that becomes a directive, not just a prediction. All right, and with that, um, it is two minutes of 12. I'd like to try to be getting out a little early always. So uh, thank you everyone for a very, uh, productive discussion and presentations this morning, Mr. Cota, Mr. Fazy, and committee. Um, see you all tomorrow morning, 8.30. Our, our first guest will be the Department of Public Service to go over the report that Mr. Fazy was talking about, where we'll look at uh, economic modeling of the impacts of weatherization. Uh, it's Department of Public Service in, in working alongside with Agency of Commerce and Community Development. So, uh, the work we've done in prior years and asking people to look into this stuff is, I feel like there's a confluence of information that's coming together right now to help us, uh, I hope, make a meaningful change this year on how, how much weatherization we get done in the state of Vermont coming year.